be here today. But first, I want to ask you to mark another event in the series on your calendars, if you would. On Thursday, November 19, at 11 a.m. in Bracken Library 225, many of you are aware that we kind of go back and forth between Bracken Library 225 and uh, here in the forum room. Sarah Parkin will speak on the topic Green Futures. Uh, many of you know her. She's an active member of the British Green Party. Ms. Parkin's held posts as International Liaison Secretary and Speaker in the Green Party, and between 1985 and 1990 was the Co-Secretary of the Coordination European Greens, which comprises 24 Green Parties from Eastern and Western Europe. She's a superb public speaker. I had the privilege of hearing her many times when I've been in England on BBC and once in person. And I think she has a very important message for all of us. And I encourage you to attend Tuesday, November 19 at 11 a.m. I hope you'll be able to be with us when she visits our campus. Today our lecturer is Dr. Robert Darton, Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of European History at Princeton University. Born in New York City, Professor Darton received his BA magna cum laude at Harvard College and his PhD in history from Oxford, which he attended as a Rhodes Scholar. After a year as a reporter for the New York Times, Professor Darton was named Fellow of the Society of Fellows at Harvard University. Since 1968, he's held appointments at Princeton, where he now directs the program in European Cultural Studies. Through the years, he's held a number of fellowships and visiting professorships, including at Guggenheim, the George Eastman Visiting Professorship at Oxford, and an appointment as a fellow of the Institute for Advanced Study in Berlin. He's also been a fellow and officer of many learned societies, as well as a member of several editorial boards. Professor Darton is co-editor of Revolution in Print, the Press in France, 1775 to 1800, and author of the literary underground of the old regime, The Kiss of La Morette, Reflections in Cultural History, and the recently published Berlin Journal, 1989 to 1990. Perhaps his best known book, and I have to confess my personal favorite, is The Great Cat Massacre and Other Episodes in French Cultural History, which won the Los Angeles Times Book Review Award for History in 1984. Permit me, me to quote briefly from the book's introduction. And I, I say to you, many of you dear friends and colleagues, that these sentences have had a special influence on my own reading and teaching in history. I quote, this book investigates ways of thinking in 18th century France. It attempts to show not merely what people thought, but how they thought, how they construed the world, invested it with meaning, and infused it with emotion. Professor Darton then discusses his methodology as a cultural historian, comparing himself to an anthropologist. I continue the quote. One thing seems clear to everyone who returns from field work. Other people are other. They do not think the way we do. And if we want to understand their way of thinking, we should set out with the idea of capturing otherness. Translated into terms of the historian's craft, that may merely sound like the familiar injunction against anachronism. It is worth repeating nonetheless, for nothing is easier than to slip into the comfortable assumption that Europeans thought and felt two centuries ago, just as we do today, allowing for the wigs and wooden shoes. We constantly need to be shaken out of a false sense of familiarity with the past, to be administered doses of cultural shock. What follows is a splendid group of essays that uncover the ways intellectuals and common people thought in what we call the Age of Enlightenment. I'm particularly delighted that Professor Darton is with us today to tell us about his more recent work, but also especially pleased that he appears as the second Dorothy and Richard W. Burkhart lecturer. Many of you know the Burkharts very, very well. You're aware of Dorothy Burkhardt's special contributions to Ball State students as an instructor of French and her service to around the modern Knox College as a member of the Board of Trustees. Dr. Richard Burkhardt is a former provost and acting president, as well as professor emeritus of history. In all, Dr. Burkhardt served Ball State for more than 30 years before retiring in 1985. The Burkhardt Lecture, a very special <coughs> one in this series, is provided through an endowment established by the Burkhardt's three children. It is their intent that the lecturers honor their parents' deep commitment to the Ball State community and be generally oriented towards subjects relating to their long-standing interests in cultural history, culture history, and foreign languages. Two of the Burkhardt children, again, some of you know a little good distance away, but I'm happy that Richard Burkhardt Jr., Chip to many of us, 
and his wife Jane have come from Ravana, Illinois and could join us today. Chip and Jane, a special welcome to you and thank you once again for helping to establish this important lecture uh, in the honor of your parents. Now I'd like our honorees, Dorothy and Rich Burkhardt, to stand and please join me in a round of applause for their many contributions to the life of this university. my great pleasure to present Professor Robert Darton speaking on the topic Revolution and Guilt in East Germany, the story of Isaac Bihar. Professor Darton. I really am delighted to be here in Muncie and to join you in honoring the Burkharts. Uh, even if they're not descended from the great Burkhardt of Basel, <laughs> Switzerland, uh, I think it's great to be a Burkhardt in Muncie, uh, Indiana. Uh, as you gathered from this over-generous introduction, I spent most of my life not in Muncie, not even in Princeton, but in the 18th century. <laughs> um, and in 1989 to 1990, I thought I was going to be living comfortably in the 18th century, trying to investigate some of these strange ways of thinking as a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in West Berlin. Uh, I'm supposed to be an expert on revolutions, but the French Revolution, which uh, is located at a very safe distance of exactly 200 years, or it was exactly 200 years in 1989, when um, a revolution actually exploded under my very nose. And I couldn't resist the temptation to try to follow it closely and attempt in some simple way to understand it. So what uh, I would like to present today is not actually a sketch of the whole revolution that hit East Germany or the German Democratic Republic, the GDR, but rather the background to it, which I would like to do in the form of a story. Historians do tell stories and not just histories. And Although it's a peculiar and highly individual story, I think it's very revealing about some of the issues that are central to the creation of a new Germany. So having said that, uh, as by way of black background, I hope that you will see what it is that I'm driving at. When we Americans uh, made a revolution in 1776, we issued a declaration of independence. When the East Germans made a revolution just almost exactly two years ago, they issued a declaration of guilt. It went as follows, and I quote from a formal act of the East German parliament, the Volkskammer. The first freely chosen parliament of the GDR admits in the name of the citizens of this country its share in the responsibility for the humiliation, persecution, and murder of Jewish men, women, and children. We feel sadness and shame and acknowledge this burden of German history. We ask the Jews of all the world for forgiveness. We ask the people of Israel to forgive the hypocrisy and hostility of the official policy of the GDR towards the state of Israel." End quote. In proclaiming their guilt towards Jews, the East Germans also took a step towards unification with West Germany because they accepted their share in what they called the burden of German history. Unification by guilt came before unification by means of the Deutsche Mark and the Constitution. It was, I submit, a strange way to found a new country. You can imagine how it might look in some future psychohistory. But it certainly distinguished the new government from the old. When the communists established the GDR in 1949, they rejected the notion that East Germany could be held accountable for any of the Nazi crimes. After all, they argued, the Nazis had tried to annihilate communists as well as Jews. And de-Nazification was the first priority of communist rule. Why should they pay reparations to Israel or agonize over history? All the guilt lay on the other side of the Iron Curtain, a cordon sanitaire, which protected them 
from being contaminated by the strains of fascism that had survived in the Federal Republic of Germany. Then, when the Iron Curtain parted, the East Germans suddenly found themselves located in another landscape. They saw that they had avoided a confrontation with their past, while their fellow Germans to the West had raked it over in plays, films, books, and most recently in the famous Historiker Streit, the great quarrel among West German historians about the nature of Nazism. So the East Germans felt compelled to rethink their history. Their new prime minister, Lothar de Maizière, kept coming back to this theme in uh, a series of speeches that he made during the first sessions of the parliament elected on March 18, 1990. Quote, this guilt must never be forgotten. From it, we intend to derive our responsibility toward the future, end quote. Or again, there is a great deal of history to be worked over in Germany. Germany is our inheritance of historical debts and historical guilt, unquote. History as guilt and historical guilt as the foundation of a revolutionary regime. I, I submit to you that these are strange ideas. In order to make sense of them and to show how they are, I believe, gnawing at the viscera of this new unified German state, I would like to tell you a story. It's the story of a wandering Jew, Isaac Behar, a Jew who at this very moment is wandering through the classrooms of East Berlin with his story, trying to get it across to high school students. I met him in the fall of 1989 in the classrooms of West Berlin. So what you are going to hear is really my story of Isaac's story. Isaac Behar has never taught school, but he has a passion for pedagogy. You should not offer children abstractions, he explains. You show them your yellow star, the real thing. You let them touch it, hold it to their chest. You pass around your identity card with Jew stamped on it. You tell them about things that happened at places they walk by every day. The yellow bench for Jews in the Tiergarten, the Gestapo in the Jewish school at the Rosenek, the burning of the synagogue on Fasanenstrasse. It's okay if they cry, says Herr Behar. Sometimes I cry with them. How can you talk about such things, things that you have been carrying in your memory for 50 years without being moved? But children often cry at the sight of a dead cat, at suffering of any kind. They empathize for a moment, and then they forget. I want them to understand. So Isaac Behar fills his talk with concrete details. The words spill out of them in a great flow. Anecdotes, jokes, homely observations about daily life in a world the students can barely imagine, and a precise account of how the Nazis annihilated his family and friends and came within an inch, time after time, of destroying him. Isaac Behar is a man with a mission. He is one of the few Jews who survived the Holocaust by hiding in the heart of Berlin itself. And he goes from school to school telling his story to the next generation of Berliners. He prefers small classes where he can look the students in the eye and high schools where they are old enough to ask searching questions. Grandfather, what did you do during the war? The question hangs over many German families, and it often goes unanswered. Herr Behar brings the students face to face with their family's past because he embodies it. Is he then a man possessed, a modern version of the wandering Jew, or another ancient mariner who has traveled to the bottom of hell and returned with a tale that he is determined to inflict on an uncomprehending public? Herr Behar does not look the part. He is short and roly-poly. 
He talks with gusto, chopping the air with his hands, jumping up to write names on the blackboard, plunging down narrative byways that seem to lead nowhere, but suddenly intersect the main story at an unexpected point, making it denser and often funnier. For Isaac Behar splices his talk with jokes and even a little ribaldry. He laughs at himself, and the students laugh with him when they are not crying. They hang on every word. They are in the presence of a great storyteller. And they know it, even if they do not suspect the pedagogy that lies behind it. Isaac Behar slaps his bald pate in astonishment at what he has just said. He had an Aryan girlfriend, a real Berliner sweetie. He is standing before Herr Ladewig's 11th graders at the Walter Rathenau Gymnasium and trying to explain the Nuremberg laws. On their side, they are trying to imagine him at age 19 in 1942, squiring around one of the blondes like the Sabinas and Brigittas in their own class. How can they understand that a Brigitte and a Jew would be executed for sleeping together in 1942. Herr Behar confesses that he was not much of a student. He copied his friend's homework while riding to school in the tram on the Kurfürstendamm. The only two subjects in which he held his own were drawing and gym. The students laugh, but girls the students laugh again. He lets them understand that he was something of a ladies' man. And indeed, the face that looks out from his earliest identification card shows a handsome young man with a glint in his eye. Young Isaac used to rendezvous with Inga Meyer on Sunday mornings. She knew she was risking her life. But who has ever been deterred by risk when they were young and in love? Besides, Isaac knew how to minimize the danger. He took different roundabout routes when he slipped out of his family's apartment at 154A Kantstrasse, and he never wore his yellow star, although that too was a potentially fatal offense. As he was leaving the apartment house on Sunday, December 13, 1942, two men in leather coats stopped him. Do you live here? No, no, certainly not. I just came for a visit. For some reason, they let him pass without even asking him to show an identification card. He hurried off to seek help from some friends, a family of Bulgarian immigrants who lived nearby. The father in this family went out to reconnoiter, but he got too close and the two men seized him, thinking he was Isaac. By then, a detachment of Gestapo had ordered the family to pack up some belongings and had discovered that Isaac was missing. Now we've got you, said one of the men. But I am not Isaac Behar, said the Bulgarian in broken German, and produced his Bulgarian passport to prove it. What are you doing here? I, I just stopped by to say hello. You can say goodbye now, the man replied, and led him up to the Behar apartment on the third floor. When the door opened, Frau Behar screamed. She thought it must be Isaac. But as soon as she saw the Bulgarian, she knew her son was safe. After another round of passport checking, the Gestapo released the Bulgarian and drove the Behars into the street. They were carted off to an internment center for the night, then marched to the Grunewald freight station and loaded into a boxcar bound for Auschwitz. Shipment number 25, 811 pieces of Jews. Stück Juden. Isaac never saw his family again. The room is silent. The students stare at the floor. Herr Behar stands up and draws an X through the first four names that he had written on the blackboard at the beginning of his talk, Nisim, Leia, Allegrine, Jean. 
and then the fifth name, his own, Isaac, der Kaddish. Some say there were six million, he says. Some say seven or five. The number is too big to comprehend. For me, it was four, everything I had in the world. Herr Behar pauses, letting the words sink in. Then, from somewhere deep inside him, a question sails across the room and hits the students like a slap in the face. Why? Another silence. Herr Behar answers softly, because they happened to be born Jews. Do you remember what you said to your parents when you left the house this morning, he asks. Probably not. Perhaps you said nothing. I said next to nothing when I left my house on December 13th, 1942. It was early and I was in a rush to see Inga but I should have said a prayer because I was the Kaddish. The students looked bewildered. Herr Behar explains that he was the third child and the first boy. According to Jewish tradition, fathers wanted to have sons because sons were ideally suited to say the prayer for the dying, known as the Kaddish. A firstborn son was often called the Kaddish, and a father counted himself happy if he had a Kaddish in the house to pray over him. At the time of Isaac's birth, his father could not believe his good fortune. Mir ist der Kaddish geboren. Mir ist der Kaddish geboren. The Kaddish has been born to me, he kept repeating, beside himself with joy. But Isaac never got to say Kaddish. He never even said goodbye. The Behars were not especially pious, but they kept up the traditions and observed the rituals. They lived on the corner of Kantstrasse and Fasanenstrasse, just a few yards down from one of the biggest synagogues in the city. Herr Behar pulls two enlarged photographs from a plastic carrying case and props them up against the blackboard. One shows the synagogue, an imposing structure, covered by three huge domes, as it appeared in the 1930s. The other is a current view of the street corner. He points to the windows of his apartment, which somehow survived the war, and to the site of the synagogue, an empty space across the street behind an Esso station. The apartment was cramped and the family poor, because Isaac's father had to feed five people from his meager income as a repairer of Turkish carpets. But, as Herr Behar sees it in retrospect, he had a blissfully happy childhood. His sisters doted on him, his father's father spoiled him as the Kaddish, and to his mother he was a macher, a feisty little guy who could fight or talk his way through anything. He felt proud and protective when he took her on his arm during their walks through the Tiergarten, the park in the middle of Berlin. She could not make it all the way across because she had been nearly crippled by a traffic accident opposite the Gedecknisskirche. They always stopped to rest on a bench in the middle of the park. But after Hitler seized power, Jews could sit only on certain benches painted yellow. Why yellow? The students cannot come up with an answer. So Herr Behar explains, if an epidemic breaks out on a ship, the captain runs up a yellow flag. If a package is filled with dangerous material, it often has a yellow label. Yellow means poison or the plague. So he did not feel like much of a macher when he sat by his mother on the yellow bench exuding as much protection as he could from beneath his yellow star. 
Anti-Semitism did not begin suddenly when Hitler seized power in 1933, Herr Behar warns the students. There were always fights and insults, Jew swine, Jew whore, and worst of all, matzah baker. Does anyone know what matzahs are? Most of the students look puzzled, but one girl says they are a kind of flat bread, like the Turkish fladenbrot everyone eats in Berlin. Right, says Herr Behar, looking pleased. I'm a Turk, too. He explains that his ancestors settled in Turkey in the 15th century when the Jews were driven out of Spain. After World War I, when Turkey and Germany had been allies, his father traveled to Berlin. When he returned, he said to Frau Behar, Lea, I have seen a country where they do not just clean the houses, they scrub the doorsteps and the sidewalks in front of the houses. So the Behars moved to Berlin. And after World War II, when Isaac no longer knew where he belonged, he requested and received a Turkish passport. He reaches into his bag of tricks and pulls the passport out. The students look impressed. They see Turkish immigrants, Gastarbeiter, every day, but not Turkish Jews. Herr Behar adds that he later received a German passport. In fact, he has a whole collection of passports, some with false names, some with no country stamped on them. Herr Behar reaches into the bag again and pulls out a matzah. This is a matzah, he proclaims, holding it up high. He breaks the matzah into pieces on a paper plate and passes it around. While the students taste it, he gives a brief account of Passover and notes that it has some similarity to the communion ritual in Christian churches. But when he was a boy, many Germans held the Jewish people responsible for the death of Christ. Many believe that Jews used to eat Christian babies and that the brown spots baked on the matzahs came from the blood of Christians. So he and the other Jews in his class were called matzah bakers. Actually, they got along quite well with the non-Jewish children at first. Young Isaac was surprised when his friend Hans Müller arrived in school one day wearing a new black tie. Yes, Herr Behar says to the students, I know it seems unbelievable, but we wore ties to school then. He wanted one like it, but Hans said that that was impossible because you had to be a member of our organization, and Isaac was a Jew. More black ties appeared. One day, the black ties ran their flag up the school flagpole and everyone sang the hymn of the Nazi youth organization. It was a good tune, Herr Behar says, and he hums a few bars. As a schoolboy, he had wanted to sing along too. But then things got nastier. No Jews appeared in shop windows. Isaac could not go to certain cafes, sports grounds, and swimming places. He had to attend a separate school for Jews, and then came November 9th. 1938, Crystal Night. On the morning after the smashing and looting, Isaac stood before his reflection in the window of his room, putting on his new school tie. Suddenly, he looked out the window and saw the synagogue burning across the Fasanenstrasse, not a hundred meters away. A large contingent of firemen had stationed themselves around it with their backs to the flames and were spraying water on the surrounding buildings so they would not catch on fire. The Behars gathered in front of the window, staring dumbfounded. As the synagogue's roof collapsed, Isaac sensed a change in his mother. Tears ran down her cheeks, but she did not sob. Instead, something seemed to snap inside her. His father put his arm around her shoulder. They are only burning stones, Leah. 
Once these stones burn, she replied, they will burn people. How right she was, says Herr Behar. Soon afterwards, his school was closed. Then came the war, then forced labor for his sisters in a factory making uniforms for his father and himself in a munitions factory. Then the fatal night of December 12, 1942 in Auschwitz. How can he explain it? How can he make a class of secular 17-year-olds understand the importance of synagogues and matzahs and the Kaddish? Most of them have never known a Jew. Only a few thousand of the 170,000 Jews in pre-war Berlin survived the Holocaust. The city itself was almost totally destroyed. The Berlin familiar to the students in the Walter Rathenau Gymnasium is another city, one that has been divided by the Cold War and filled up in some of its western neighborhoods by Turks. The students seem to imagine young Isaac as a Turkish Gastarbeiter, but one with perfect German and without a mustache. Above all, how can Herr Behar convey the reality of the Holocaust. It began here, just down the road, he says. Grunewald, your local stop on the elevated railway, used to be the main point of departure for the deportations. The Jews were marched through the streets and loaded onto special trains, 40 to a boxcar, in the Grunewald freight yard. It all happened in broad daylight and with Prussian precision, down to the booking of the victims and the synchronization of their departure with the preparation of the gas in Auschwitz. When your grandparents claim they never knew about it, don't believe them. Say to them, grandfather, grandmother, I can understand that you would rather not talk about it. You don't have to lie. Herr Behar explains that he too was forced to ride that train. But the Gestapo did not catch him for more than a year. After his family disappeared, he went underground, living by his wits and the few rules for survival that he picked up among the other hunted Jews. One, do not form a group. The more isolated you are, the better. Two, do not talk with strangers and have a false story ready in case you are required to talk. Three. Once you have found a hiding place, venture out as little as possible and always return by a different roundabout route. At first, Isaac thought he could hide in public bomb shelters. But the special military police, known as Kettenhunde, guard dogs, checked identity cards there. So, when an air raid occurred, he did the opposite. He climbed onto a roof. However, he soon learned that wardens always inspected the roofs for firebombs after a raid, and he only saved himself during one inspection by hiding behind a water tank. He knew better than to try to sleep in movie theaters because they too were inspected by Kettenhunde. So he usually spent the nights in cellars and the days in subways or the streets, walking about and trying to look inconspicuous. At least money was no problem. When the Jews were forced to turn in all their jewelry and other valuables, many of them slipped some of their possessions to Gentile friends with the understanding that the friends would use them to provide help in time of need. Isaac's father had turned over his savings to such a friend who gave them back to Isaac after the family was deported. Of course, Isaac did not have a ration card but he could buy cheap food without rations just before mealtimes in certain restaurants. He avoided old friends because he knew that, there was, that he was on every Nazi wanted list and that anyone who helped a Jew would be killed as an enemy collaborator. He even stayed out of barber shops where he felt exposed to spies and he did not dare use public baths because the Kettenhunde often swept through them. By April 1943, 
Isaac was so hairy and unkempt that he feared his looks alone might provoke a policeman to demand his identity card. In desperation, he called his former boss in the munitions factory, a man named Behrens, who had shown some sympathy for the Jews condemned to forced labor under him. Of course, Behrens might also turn him in to the Gestapo. But sometimes, Herr Behar assures the students, you have to gamble on the existence of some goodwill in the world. When he phoned, Isaac said only Behar in a muffled voice. Behrens replied, six o'clock today, the usual clock. What clock was that? Herr Behar asks the students. None of them knows. So Herr Behar produces another photograph from the 1930s. The clock by the kiosk in front of the Bahnhof Zoo at Hardenbergstrasse, the best known meeting place in old Berlin. Isaac got there early and stationed himself across the street in order to see whether Behrens might be followed by any suspicious looking characters. When Behrens arrived, he seemed to be alone. So Isaac swallowed hard and walked past him saying, Behar. He was so transformed in his appearance that Behrens had not recognized him. They walked off to a cafe where Isaac explained that he could not go on like this. He needed to get himself cleaned up and to find a hiding place. Behrens took a deep breath. It won't be easy, he said, but he would see what he could do and they would meet again in a day or two. At their next meeting, Behrens gave Isaac a slip of paper with a typewritten name and address. He had a cousin who had a colleague who had a friend who knew a porter in the Hotel Adlon named Kozlovsky. Kozlovsky was willing to tidy Isaac up and to hide him in his apartment in Vedding near the Wittler bread factory. Everything worked perfectly. Kozlovsky insisted only that Isaac leave the room not more than once a day and that they meet every evening at 8 o'clock when the porters changed service in order to be sure that neither of them had been arrested. After several weeks, Isaac regained his normal appearance and began to feel human again, although he had to lie low and to avoid using any light at night. One night, while going to the toilet in the dark, he slipped on the stairs and woke up someone with a noise. A door opened, throwing a shaft of light in the stairway. Isaac dashed inside the toilet and bolted the door. No one came. But he decided that he would have to protect himself against a similar accident by buying a flashlight. The next day, as he bent over the flashlights in a shop on the Kot Busserdam, his eyes met those of the saleswoman. She appeared to be much older than he, in her mid-thirties, he reckoned, but pretty. And she looked at him hard. Now, the last thing he had thought of was women, Herr Behar assures the students, whose attention suddenly grows more intense than ever. But before he knew it, he had blurted out, do you want a cup of coffee? Mm. Why, yes, she said with a smile. Pick me up here at six o'clock. Once outside the store, Isaac began to reflect. He would have to make up a story, but he wasn't very good at lying and he needed an excuse to free himself in time to meet Kozlovsky in the apartment at 8 o'clock. He decided he would be Hans Müller, a translator working the night shift in a government office. 
Like many of the Jewish families expelled from Spain, the Behars spoke Ladino, a Spanish dialect. Isaac could fall back on that, as well as on bits of French retained from school and trust to his luck. The saleswoman turned out to be Betty Krug, 33 and divorced. Her former husband had given her the shop in place of alimony, and she seemed to want a man. There were not many suitable men in Berlin in 1943, Herr Behar explains to the students. But customs were different then. You did not use the intimate do until after the first kiss. And the first kiss did not occur until after many dates. On the third date, he had barely touched Betty's hand. And the situation seemed impossible. Something is wrong, she said to him. Once again, he was seized by an impulse, and he told her his whole story. When he had finished, she said, my God, a Jew, an illegal. Then, after a long pause, couldn't you arrange to stay out later some night? Back at the apartment, Kozlovsky reacted with predictable horror, as if things aren't already difficult enough. Now a woman. But as an exception, for one evening only, he extended the deadline until 11 o'clock. Isaac and Betty had dinner at Havel's Weinstube by the Rosenek on Hohenzollern Just a few blocks from your school, Herr Behar tells the students. You go by it every day. He would never forget that evening. After dinner, Betty said that she had baked a cake at home. Did he want to come to her apartment for some more dessert? The next morning, Isaac got back to the apartment in time to meet Kozlowski when the porters began their morning shift at 6 o'clock. There was no time for a goodbye and no need for an explanation. Isaac moved in with Betty. She had wanted to install him in a summer house which her sister owned in Grunau on the outskirts of the city. But the sister did not want to get mixed up with a foreigner. Betty did not dare say that Hans was a Jew. So Isaac found himself in a three-room apartment, the greatest comfort he had ever known, fussed over, fed, and loved by another Berliner sweetie. He could hardly believe it. Only a few weeks ago, he was living in coal bins and alleys like an animal. Now he really felt human. Isaac was loved, but he was not really free. He could not wander about Berlin at will, and whenever he ventured out, he took a different route back, crossing the street if he smelled a Kettenhund, for one ID check would be enough to do him in. Little by little, however, he became more relaxed, extending his forays into cafes where other suspicious characters met and exchanged bits of gossip. By the summer of 1944, it was clear that the Germans were losing the war, but Berlin had become more dangerous. The deportation trains from the Grunewald station continued unabated, and the Gestapo were finding it increasingly difficult to fill them with their quota of Jews. Isaac sometimes picked up reports about the situation from other Jews who surfaced from the underground in the Café d'Aubrin. You probably have had coffee there yourselves, says Herr Behar to the students. Today it is called the Café Bristol on the Kudam near Knesebeckstrasse. They would sit at separate tables and talk obliquely while keeping their eyes on the door. One day, a well-dressed man, about 45 years old, sat down at Isaac's table. He offered Isaac a cup of the Erzatz coffee served in the place and began a casual conversation. Isaac fell back on his Hans Müller translator story, which seemed to go over well. 
the man, a Herr Wegener, who said he also worked in a government office, responded sympathetically without pressing Isaac for details. They met again a few days later. This time, Wegener said he had two daughters, age 18 and 19, and invited Isaac to join them for a meal. At the reference to the daughters, Isaac's ears pricked up. Not that he was tired of Betty, but he would not say no to a chance to meet someone closer to him in age. Herr Behar pauses, giving the students time to exchange some looks. The daughters turned out to be uninteresting, but Wegener became increasingly sympathetic. And after the third dinner, he said, we have taken you into our hearts. If you ever have any problems, we are friends. We can help. Isaac said, thank you, but he had no problems. Not even small problems, not even middle size. Isaac hesitated for a minute, but then again, as with Betty, he blurted everything out, except his liaison with Betty. <laughs> I can help you, said Herr Wesener. He could arrange for Isaac to escape to Czechoslovakia. False passport, train ticket, money, everything. He would drive Isaac to the station himself, and his friend Prokop would pick him up in Prague. Isaac thought it over on the way home. To get out of Berlin, and with the protective cover of a passport. But how could he leave Betty? How could he even tell her? <clears throat> he decided to keep it to himself and to let his new friend make the preparations. A few days later, Isaac packed his belongings. He had not told Betty and she was not in the apartment. So he wrote a note. I am in safety. That was all. She had fed him, loved him, risked her life. He walked out, leaving the key behind. I was a shit, says Herr Behar, a shit. As promised, Wesener had everything ready. He dropped Isaac off at the Anhalter train station, saying, have a good trip, greet Prokop for me. Isaac stood before the departure board, a bag in each hand, looking for the track number of the train to Prague. Two hands grabbed his arms from behind. His bags dropped. He spun around and he found himself in handcuffs. You can't do this to me, he protested. I am Hans Müller. Müller, Behar, it's all the same to us, said one of the plane's clothesmen. They led Isaac off to a black opal limousine, and soon afterwards he was sitting in cell P1 under the police headquarters in Alexanderplatz. Herr Behar leans a photograph of the police headquarters against the board. It is a gigantic building, but the students do not recognize it because it was obliterated during the war. Besides, at that time, September 1989, very few of them had ever set foot in Alexanderplatz. It lay on the other side of the wall, and they knew only West Berlin, a very different city from the Berlin of young Isaac Behar. Cell P1 was like an oriental bazaar, Herr Behar explains. It was as big as their classroom, and it contained 30 prisoners, Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and petty criminals of all varieties. They did a lively trade in cigarettes and newspapers while waiting for the police to dispose of their cases. Like everything else in Prussia, the jail was run with bureaucratic precision. If a guard took a prisoner out of a cell, he had to fill out a receipt, which in turn was entered in a register kept by a superintendent. 
Isaac got to know the system because the police used him as a translator whenever they needed to interrogate prisoners who spoke Spanish or French. One day, while waiting to do an interrogation, Isaac fell into conversation with a new guard who looked sympathetic. The guard asked him how he had been caught. And after hearing Isaac's story, he said, do you know anyone outside who can help you? Once again, Isaac hesitated. He had concealed Betty's existence from the undercover agent who had befriended him in the cafe, and he knew that nice cops sometimes gathered intelligence in jails. But he decided to take a chance, and he gave Betty's name and address. A few days later, the guard took him aside. Betty greets you, he said, and handed Isaac a tiny piece of cake. They devised a plan for Isaac's escape. The guard would summon Isaac for an interrogation, take him to a hallway leading to an exit, and turn in the receipt as if he had been locked inside the cell. On the agreed date, Betty was waiting outside to whisk Isaac off to her apartment. But on that day, a few hours before the guard was to fetch him, Isaac was led off to the deportation center at the former Jewish old age home at the Große Hamburger Straße. The Gestapo had been holding him until they had rounded up 39 other Jews, the required number for a boxcar. By then, they had difficulty in reaching their quota because 98% of Berlin's Jews had already been exterminated. Isaac was to be in the final stage of the final solution. <coughs> Enough information had reached Isaac through the underground grapevine for him to know what to expect. He knew that they would be trucked to the Grunewald Freight Station and herded like animals into a boxcar. A Jew named Stargarter, who dressed in a pseudo-Nazi uniform complete with jackboots, would take charge of the operation, kicking and cursing them unmercifully in an effort to save his own skin by ingratiating himself with the SS. The train would slow down for a sharp curve near the Erkner station, the last S-Bahn station within the city limits. That was their only chance to escape. With three others, Isaac planned to pry open two air slats, which would be boarded over high up on the side of the boxcar and to leap out at the Erkner curve. At first, everything happened according to their plan. They, they had found an old lead tube and a curtain rod support, which could serve as tools and which they hid under their clothes. Stargarter turned out to be even nastier than expected, but they withstood his insults as they climbed into the boxcar, the only carload of Jews on that train. It was September 6, 1944, the 57th shipment to Auschwitz. A Gestapo officer with four ordinary soldiers guarded them from the next car. In order to prevent escape attempts, the officer had put Isaac in charge of the Jews and had told him that if anyone tried to get away, he and nine others would be shot. Nonetheless, as soon as the train pulled out of the station, Isaac climbed on the back of another man and started to pry off the boards covering the air slat. But Shortly before they reached the Erkner station, there was a loud noise and the train ground to a halt. I'm done for, thought Isaac. They saw us and now they are going to shoot me. After a long wait, they heard the rest of the train drive off. Their car had been uncoupled and left on a sidetrack. They didn't know why perhaps so that the execution could take place without disturbing the passengers. The soldiers 
herded them out of the boxcar and held them at gunpoint while the Gestapo officer took Isaac aside. Instead of drawing his gun, however, he produced an explanation. The car had broken an axle. They would have to spend the night at the siding and board another boxcar, which would be sent uh, the next day in time to make the late evening train to Auschwitz. Meanwhile, Isaac should choose two or three others to help him carry some pots of broth for the evening meal, which would be delivered to the nearest street by a truck from the deportation center. Immediately, Isaac began to formulate a new plan. He chose his three friends. While studying the terrain, they hauled the broth to the Jews huddled outside the boxcar, and they arranged to do the same thing the next evening at about 9.30, when their final meal would arrive. At a signal from Isaac, they would drop the pots, kick the soldier accompanying them in the testicles, and run off into the woods across the street. After a sleepless night and a miserable day, the four set off with a soldier to fetch the broth. But before Isaac gave the signal, the other three panicked and ran for it. The soldier fired after them in the dark while Isaac stood there helplessly cursing his fate. In order to prevent any more mishaps, the soldiers ordered all of the Jews back into the boxcar. Isaac said that he needed to relieve himself and asked for permission to do it behind a nearby bush so that he would not foul the car. As he had proven his trustworthiness by not running off, a soldier let him go off on his own. Isaac squatted down for a second, then dashed behind the boxcar and sprinted for the woods. Never did he, or perhaps any other human being, run so fast. He heard shots and shouts, but he kept running deep into the forest on the outskirts of Berlin. He knew, however, that it would be far safer to hide in a huge city than in a suburban forest. So, after the shooting died down, Isaac found his way back to the Erkner station, took the next S-Bahn train to the Bahnhof Zoo in central Berlin, and soon was walking down Joachim Stahlerstrasse looking for a whore. Why a whore? The students are astonished. Herr Behar explains that everyone in the underground believed that the best place to go if you got in a tight spot was a whorehouse. He found a woman, pretty or ugly, it didn't matter and he couldn't remember, and soon was inside a cheap hotel. She took offense when he told her he only wanted to sleep. He explained that he had just arrived from Cologne, where he had been bombed out of his apartment. But ten marks quieted her, and another three marks pacified the madam who ran the establishment. Fortunately, the police had paid Isaac for his interpreting in the prison. Another example of Prussian exactness. He could not yet feel safe, however, because the madam had warned him that the police sometimes made identity card checks in the middle of the night. Sure enough, through a half-sleep, Isaac heard knocking. At first he thought he was dreaming, but it came closer and closer. And soon it was only a few doors away accompanied by a loud voice, open up, police, identity card. For a second, Isaac gave in to hopelessness. But then his will to survive surged back. He had fallen on the bed without taking off his clothes, so he leaped up, threw open the window, and jumped into the dark. He landed on a vegetable garden in a courtyard about 15 feet below, back into the street, to the Bahnhof Zoo, into the first S-Bahn train, and out again a few stations later. Only then did Isaac notice that he had ripped his trousers and that his left leg was throbbing with pain. He had torn his Achilles tendon. Also, he had reached the point of exhaustion. After staggering into a park outside the station, he collapsed on a bench and fell into a deep sleep. Okay. 
When he woke up the next morning, Isaac discovered that he was in the Lietzensee Park and that he could barely walk. His ankle was swollen to three times its normal size. Using a fallen branch as a cane, he managed somehow to hobble back to the subway and to make a train to the Kotbusser Tor. After an agonizing struggle up the Kotbusser Dam, he stood in front of Betty's shop window, waving to her as she served a client. She nearly fainted, but she excused herself without arousing the customer's suspicion and slipped him the key to her apartment, Plan Ufer 4, another desperate walk. At last, however, Isaac made it back to Betty's bed. This time, she persuaded her sister to let her hide him in the summer house in Grunau. Isaac had given out the address of Betty's apartments too often for it to be safe, and he needed several weeks of healing before he could walk again. So he remained in Grunau on the eastern fringe of the city while Betty took care of him, more a nurse than a lover. He stayed there through the winter and into the spring of 1945. Betty returned to her apartment, and the Allies advanced on Berlin. One morning in May, Isaac looked out the window. Soldiers were posted outside, soldiers in strange uniforms, Russians. He ran out the door shouting, I'm free, I'm free. The soldiers looked at him incredulously, then raised their rifles. I'm, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew, Isaac screamed. But they did not understand German. All around them, German soldiers had been stripping off their uniforms in order to pass as civilians. Isaac might well be a Nazi. They marched him off at gunpoint to a neighboring villa, which was serving as headquarters for a Soviet general while the Red Army overran Berlin. For three days, they kept him under guard, and he kept protesting, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew. At last, an intelligence officer arrived, looked him over skeptically, and spoke to him in broken German. Isaac insisted he was Jewish and offered to pull his pants down to prove it. But the officer was unimpressed. Many non-Jews were circumcised, he said, and many Nazis were masquerading as victims of Nazism. He left and returned with a copy of a Hebrew prayer book. Read, he said, putting the book in Isaac's hands. Isaac, the Kaddish, knew how to open a holy book. He had been bar mitzvahed, so he could read in Hebrew. He read and read as if his life depended on it, and indeed it did. Lansman, cried the officer. He took Isaac in his arms in a great Russian Jewish bear hug. And from that day to this, Isaac Behar has been a free man. Freedom, Russians, Sephardim, Jews who are Turks and Spaniards and officers in the Red Army, the categories bounced off the walls, confounding the realities in the well-ordered classroom of Herr Ladewig's 11th graders. Could such things have happened in this very city to this very man? It was a lesson they would never forget. Sure, I think.
question. back in the 18th century now. Uh, I think it's important for Isaac Behar's story to be told again and again. It's best told, of course, by Behar. He usually uh, takes about three hours to tell it. Uh, he goes and talks with the principals in the high schools, and he says, I want three hours. I want a small group. I want kids who are 15 or 16 or 17 years old. Sometimes he comes back and takes three days to tell it. Uh, I first heard it, actually, from my own daughter, who was in high school in West Berlin while I was there, working on the 18th century, and she came back with her eyes as big as saucers and said, Daddy, I've just heard the most amazing story. So I decided I would like to meet uh, Behar, whose story I heard through my own daughter. And at that time, she just arrived in Berlin, and her German was less than perfect, and you know, I wasn't sure how much she had invented and how much she'd got straight. So I spent some evenings with him, and then I began going around with him from school to school, not knowing exactly why, excepting I found myself so uh, caught up in it, and, and for what it symbolized, because as you can tell from the way I tried to narrate it, the interesting thing was not just what happened to Isaac Behar, but his rapport with the students, and how this burden of German history is being transmitted through a kind of oral tradition that I think is crucial. So in a way, uh, I'm trying to continue that here. But my next book is uh, lo firmly located in 18th century Europe. <laughs> yeah. One of the, one of the yeah. things that struck me in, in your talk was the pending David Duke problem in the United States. And I wonder if American students are so removed from a knowledge of the Holocaust, do you think that's a problem in our nation's current flirtation? With David Duke? Well, I certainly do share your notion that it is a problem. I mean, I think it's crucial that uh, young people know the story of Isaac Behar or their own families or friends of their families, or if they don't have any friends who came out of the world of Nazism, that they at least read history books uh, and that they understand how not just Jews, but blacks and women and minorities of all sorts or just people who are different can be victimized by a sort of crushing uh, majority without any respect for civil rights. I mean, that can sound too much like preaching or facile liberalism. That, that's not what I have in mind. I really do feel that there is a burden of history, that it's incumbent on those of us who are historians or just citizens to study it and to get it across. So I find it appalling when I run into students at Princeton, who we were mentioning this with the Schwartzes this morning, who, when you say the war, don't know what you're referring to. Because to them, it could be the war in the Gulf, it could be Vietnam, it could be lots of things. Whereas for me, it's World War II. Uh, now, you know, I should probably more be more clear when I say the war, but it seems to me that the trauma of World War II is something that we do stand in danger of forgetting. Uh, I don't think that Nazism was, you know, just another unhappy episode like many. I think it was the supreme evil of Western history. Uh, and that if uh, some politician comes along and advocates what he calls Nazism, that this is a very distressing phenomenon, and that it's crucial that you know, young people know what Nazism really was. But that, I mean, that's all I can say by way of answer. Maybe it, uh, there's more to it than that. But I, I can't understand that such things happen. And what we need to do is to understand the immediate uh, causes and surroundings of it, as well as what Nazism itself was way over there in Berlin, a place that I'm sure David Duke knows nothing about. <laughs> is there any noticeable difference uh, within uh, formerly East Germany, East Berlin, and West Berlin on the acceptance or listening to the uh, I actually left Berlin before he began uh, teaching in East Berlin. 
I left in August of 1990, and he began in the next fall. So I don't know what the reaction has been in the East as opposed to the West. He was quite worried, and in some cases, he had difficulty with the parents of some of the students also in West Berlin. Um, my own impression in going with them to schools is that the school teachers, the principals, were thought it was very important that he talk to their students. And I'm a little skeptical, actually, about the extent of the threat. But he did say that uh, the, the story was so strong that uh, he had received some threatening mail, for example. Um, I mean, this is a whole country in which everyone was a Nazi or collaborating with a Nazi or hiding from the Nazis in some way. I mean, the entire population, of course, inevitably, was uh, touched by it. And therefore, uh, there are lots of survivors today who are very sensitive to it. So, I, I mean, I can't answer your question, but in general, it seems to me that be, this, this is one country, one culture that has been cut down the middle, or two-thirds of the way through, and separated for a half a century. I mean, depending on how you measure generations, you could call that three generations. So the extent to which the two Germanys had grown apart amazed me. And I really was struck by, one, the ignorance of West Germans about East Germany. I mean, I knew I was ignorant, but I assumed the West Germans had contact through their families and friends and knew what was going on there. I was amazed at how little they knew about it. Most of the people I'd met had never been there or had just set foot in East Berlin at the tourist center around uh, Karl Marx Platz and Alexander Platz. So this is another world, the world of East Berlin. It's another political culture. And it seems to me inevitable that they would look at their relation to the common past in a different way. There's a lot of talk today about neo-Nazism in Germany. I think there's more of it in the West than in the East. Uh, but it does, I mean, there are symptoms of it existing you know, everywhere. I guess I'm bothered by the word guilt. I mean, uh, we're all guilty in all histories, in all past. I mean, uh, how much guilt do I feel for our treatment of the blacks? How much guilt do I feel for our annihilation of the, of the Indians? You know, I, I personally don't feel. I guess I want to know about it and all that, but I personally don't feel guilty. And I don't like the word guilt. Uh, uh, maybe it carries a different connotation. Uh, maybe uh, it, it bothers me. Yeah. And maybe you like to have it bother. Maybe that. <laughs> maybe that's good. Yeah. Well, the guilt is not my word. I mean, I was quoting the elected prime minister of East Germany after the collapse of the communist regime. You remember there was an East German independent government that existed uh, after the elections of March 18, 1990, until reunific reunification actually occurred a few months later. And so what they see, at least what some of their leaders see, is, and the word, their word for it is guilt. Now, I agree that what we talk, we talk about guilt trips and laying a guilt trip on someone, and that's what kids say. Uh, what is guilt uh, and so on? It's a rather mysterious thing. I think it's not accidental, though, that they choose that word because it comes out of a deep Lutheran past in North Germany. And Lothar de Maizière, who was the prime minister, he was a lawyer, but his main uh, occupation was um, working with the Lutheran Church. I mean, he specialized in church affairs, and he was a member of the consistory that ran the Lutheran Church in East Germany. That was the, really the only independent institution in a state that was really basically a Stalinist world. But the people, the center around which the East German Revolution developed was the church. Uh, Lutheran ministers were leaders in small towns and cities uh, throughout the country. They had been marginalized, penalized by the uh, Stalinist system, and yet they had a great deal of integrity in the eyes of the population uh, because they were independent. So it's not surprising that ministers should use the word guilt, and I think, think of it in Christian terms, in fundamental Lutheran terms, if you like. Uh, in the first government forum, there were three ministers actual practicing ministers, uh, Christian ministers who became ministers in the government, three of them, 
It was amazing. One of them had been jailed for refusing to do his military service, and he was made Minister of the Army. <laughs> <laughs> so guilt is their concept. And I mean, I'm not myself rhetorically trying to suggest that we're all guilty, but I do think it important to understand the categories that they are using to, un to think through their own past. Uh, you're talking about guilt and uh, about educating the uh, West Germans, probably now East Germans, about being more tolerant. How do you interpret in this entire context the hostilities that the Germans have against uh, other uh, nationalities or other minorities which is going on or has been going on during the time you have been there? Yeah. I don't want to name names, but you know, yes. <laughs> several. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's no question that this hostility to, out, to foreigners is a strong and insidious force in the new Germany. There's even an, a German word for it, Ausländerfeindlichkeit. Uh, it's very clear and prominent in people's consciousness in West and East Germany. I think the problem takes a different form in the two halves of what, or the one-third, which is East Germany, the new five uh, states that have been incorporated in the Federal Republic of Germany. It's, it takes a different form there from what it takes in the western part. Why? Well, the foreigners there are not really so much refugees from the collapsing Soviet Empire. They will be, I think, soon. And indeed, Germany may be overrun by these people if we have starvation this winter or next winter in the Soviet Union which I think is not at all excluded. But um, the main foreigners they knew in East Germany were many of them, for example, um, blacks from Angola, um, Mozambique, uh, Cambodians, some Vietnamese. Uh, they were brought in to labor in these extraordinarily um, cruel factory systems, especially in heavy industry. And they lived in separate enclaves. Sometimes they had barracks built for them within the factory grounds. Uh, these people lived in virtually total segregation from the East German population. Never spoke German, never were integrated. There was a clause in the treaty between the former GDR and North Vietnam, which said that if any Vietnamese woman accompanied her husband to East Germany and became pregnant, that she and her children would have to be shipped back to Vietnam. I mean, this was a kind of virtual slave labor, really. And these people are not easily assimilated in a body politic. Now, that's very different from, let us say, the Turks in West Germany. I mean, I'm uh, sure they had a lot of problems with Turks, but I think actually the West Germans have dealt with the um, Turkish phenomenon very well. So sure, there is Ausländer Feindlichkeit, but, um, and it's especially strong in East Germany, and it's a nasty business. Um, I don't know where it's going to go, and I think that, uh, I mean, I'm no prophet. Historians like to think that, you know, we know what's going to happen in the future. I'm, I was one of the many who just assumed that the Berlin Wall would be there all the time. And when I first uh, visited it, uh, you know, I thought it was like the Great Wall of China and that my grandchildren would be visiting it in the same way. Well, my own daughter was dancing on the top of it, literally, on the morning after. And I was dancing there, too. It was quite a feeling. So I don't myself uh, see myself as a prophet of what's going to happen. In my prophetic moments, I, I, I feel optimistic about Germany and their ability to cope with foreigners. In my, in, in my optimistic moments, in my pessimistic moments, I see all of Eastern Europe collapsing. Poland, probably Hungary, Slovakia, if not Czechoslovakia. You know what's happening in, Czechoslova in um, Yugoslavia today. And the conditions in Romania and Bulgaria are appalling. Uh, while the Soviet Union, it seems to me, is facing irredeemable problems. I don't see any way out for the Soviets except a kind of total disintegration and uh, slippage into sub-third world conditions. I mean, that sounds 
sounds gloomy, but uh, I've, I've been wrong so many times, let's hope I'm, I'm wrong now. I do, but I do sense the West Germans, contrary to what seemed to be happening in the first few months after unification, I do sense from the information I get that through friends and so on, that they are indeed investing huge sums of money in the former East Germany. It may become a kind of mezzogiorno is the way they talk about it, like southern Italy to, to northern Italy. It may well become that. But that's not so bad, actually. Uh, and there are civil rights, and the police state has been destroyed. I, I mean, I see this as a, as a remarkable achievement. But what's going to happen east of that? I mean, let's hope that Poland can make it. But when you get east of the Polish-Russian border, it's, uh, I find, appalling, just appalling. We're we'll going to have to cut this off. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for a superb, superb lecture. Bob.